April 26, 1895, Little Italy, New York, New York. Maria Barbella, a 22-year-old Italian immigrant who worked in a sweatshop, is angry with her boyfriend, Domenico Cataldo. He'd promised to marry her, but was now reneging and leaving out of New York Harbor on a boat back to Italy. When she followed him to a saloon to beg him to marry her, her mother came along. When he told her he would never marry her and called her a pig, Maria was done and Domenico was dead. This is the story of Maria Barbella, a crime of passion in Little Italy. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. And for, I'm going off the board today, for our Latin-speaking friends. <laughs> in ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, just in case Socrates is listening. <laughs> grata, grata, grata. There you go. Very nice. <laughs> well, wherever you're listening, be sure to like, rate, and review. That helps other people to find us. You can subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And yep. You can also watch us on YouTube. Be yes. sure to subscribe there. And then every week when we have a new episode on Wednesday, all you have to do is look at your phone and it's going to tell you. We'll be bugging you. Chris wants to talk to about <laughs> true crime today to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We are going back in time okay. to one of Rob's favorite places in New York City. Mm. Little Italy. Oh, nice. I love Little Italy. He does. The first time I got to see him on Mulberry when he like we got out of the cab and all the lights were in the streets. He was like, now this is cool. Yeah. And I was like, yes, it is. And yep. we're going to eat some really good food while and, we're here. And what's amazing, I'd been to, to New York hundreds of times, but I'd never been to Little Italy. You know, I'd been to Chinatown and, you know, uh, Greenwich and all this, but I'd never been to Little Italy. And when I got there, it was like, this yeah, and great. he loves Italian food. Ugh. Don't we all love Italian food? Pasta, I mean, ugh, Pasta. the best. Yes. So that's where we're headed to today. It's it's an interesting little case. Okay. It's a few little twists and turns. I found it intriguing, so I wanted to bring it to you. Nice. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. Listverse, Murderpedia. Yep, this one even made it to Murderpedia. <laughs> the New York Times, the New York Daily News, infamousnewyork.com. NewYorkHistory.org. There is a book by Adana Pucci, The Trials of Maria Barbella. I did not read it. I did find some excerpts from it where it's referenced in other source material. I will have a link to the book and all the other sources in the show notes. All right. Well, I have a fresh haircut, a full cup of coffee. Are you ready to do this? See. Si. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> Maria Barbella was born in the village of Fernandina, Basilicata region of Italy. I'm okay. going to mess some of these up. If you're Italian, I apologize now. Yeah, it's all right. Her family immigrated to Mulberry Bend, New York in 1892. Okay. And from what I can tell, there are three children in the Barbella family. Maria has a sister and a brother. Okay. But they moved to New York City and the Mulberry Bend... And this place was a gathering area for generations of New York's underworld. Uh-oh. There were the Dead Rabbits, the Gambino crime family. Oh, and yeah. I'm not even lying when I tell you that I had dinner there one night, and I'm positive <laughs> there was a mafia meeting going on in the corner. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. I'm, I'm obsessed with two things, World War II history and the mafia. I think those are the two most interesting parts of our history. Very interesting. Yeah. But Mulberry Bend was like a place with horrific conditions, and it was the incubator for the gangs of New York. Hmm. And today, only a tiny bit of this neighborhood exists. It was the foul core of New York's slums. Oh, really? It sat between Worth and Bayard Streets, and it was where the poorest, 
the unwanted and the unwelcome lived. Hmm. It was a multiracial, multi-ethnic, polyglot community. A melting pot. It was. Polyglot, meaning lots of different languages going on. Right. Now, interestingly enough, in the days before the American Revolution, the street was named for a grove of mulberry trees on the banks of the Collect Pond, which was one of Manhattan's freshwater reservoirs. And the pond's marshlands forced engineers to route the country lane in a west to east bend, which would become Mulberry Bend. Oh, I didn't know that. But it became a sewage dump. And in 1870, the city council drained the pond by digging a canal that still runs under Canal Street today. Look at that. Yeah. I'm learning all sorts of stuff today. They filled it all in and Mulberry Bend came into existence. For the most of the 1800s, the bend consisted of Irish immigrants, Rob, Yay. Rob's family, <laughs> <laughs> and free African Americans. Okay. But by the 1800s, there was a surge of Italian immigrants, and Maria and her parents immigrated to America, settled in the Mulberry Bend. Okay. 1892. Hmm. Now, in November of 1893, after being in the United States for only 11 months, Maria, who was working at a factory as a seamstress, happened upon a shoe shine booth at the corner of Canal and Elm Streets, which is now Lafayette Street, mm. all still Little Italy. Sure. Today on this street corner in New York City, you will find a coffee room, a marketing group, a Buddhist association, and a bank. <laughs> well, there's a combination. But back then, there was a shoe shine stand on the corner. Gotcha. But as she walked home from work in the fall of 1893, Maria would take her time as she passed the shoe shine booth. Why, you might ask? Well, because working there was Domenico Cataldo. Okay. 27 years old, he was an Italian immigrant like Maria and everybody else in the neighborhood, basically. Gotcha. Domenico wasn't handsome. In fact, his face had smallpox scars. Oh, wow. But he always stopped to talk to the very shy Maria. Hmm. And she always blushed at his attention. Kind of like Rocky and... Yo, Adrian. <laughs> Yo, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we stop by the pet store. And she it's can... kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maria herself wasn't a Sophia Loren. Okay. From everything I read about her, she was a little plain, but I've seen her photos and she doesn't seem plain at all to me. Hmm. When Maria finally found the nerve to say hello back to him, to Domenico, right. she found out that they both came from the Basilicata region on the ankle of Italy's boot. Which is really important to Italian heritage. Yeah, where you're from. Yeah. Now, during their second chat, Domenico bragged about all the money he had, <laughs> telling her his bank account held $923. Ooh, baby. And today he'd be telling her, hey, hot stuff, I got $31,188.17 in the bank. Yeah, baby. <laughs> After telling her how much money he had, he then tells her in Italian, of course, quote, if I find the right girl, I will marry her, end quote. There you go. He wanted to marry and open a barber shop. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Don't hold him to it. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, Maria is pushing 25, although I did read somewhere else that she was 22. Kind of hard to get correct records in 1896. Sure. But that's a little old for the time to be single because life expectancy was 48 years for a woman. I looked it up. Really? Yeah. So she's already having her midlife crisis. Wow. Do, uh, do ladies have midlife crises? 48. 48. For man. a woman. Jeez. It was less for a man, honey. Sorry. Well, Especially an Irish man. Well, it's because we do stupid things. In lower Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> What she didn't know was that Domenico was already married. He had a wife and children. Oh, man. In Italy. Oh, no. wow. But Domenico began showing up at the clothing factory, Lewis Grainer and Company, on Broadway near Spring Street to walk Maria home. She kept it a secret from her parents because she was afraid they wouldn't approve of him. Mm. 
She lived with her parents on Elizabeth Street near the Mulberry Bend slum. Remember, her family has only been in the United States for a year, but they were holding on to their traditional old world Italian roots and they wanted to meet Domenico. Sure. But Domenico always had an excuse for not walking Maria all the way to the door. So he would meet her after work, walk her all the way home, but not all the way home. <laughs> it made me think of my big fat Greek wedding where yeah. she makes him park down the street so she could walk <laughs> home. Which house is yours? Uh, this is good, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. But when you were talking about the, the family needing to meet, if you remember in The Godfather when uh, he goes over to the old country and he wants to meet his... Wants his, to court the daughter. Right. The whole family, they have to meet him and they're with... I mean, it's like 30 people. Yep, <laughs> that's true. They were all trailing behind him. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to have that theme in my head. <laughs> Sorry. This is what it's like being married to a musician, y'all. <laughs> That's the cross you have to bear. It is. <laughs> Lord, help me. <laughs> but after these two are chatty, and he starts coming to work to walk her home on most days, he's there on most days, Domenico started to expect things of Maria. And soon she started to feel pressured by Domenico to have sex. Hmm. He pawed at her petticoats. That's what I read. <laughs> that was hot then. So much of this story is is uh, documented in the New York Times. Hey, so baby. Nice he, petticoats. He pawed at her petticoats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Maria, who's really naive and young, she confided in her parents. So she's like, yeah, this is what he wants me to do. And uh, their parents are like, wait, wait no, <laughs> What'd no, <you> say? <laughs> no way, yeah. no how. Yeah. You're not doing anything with this man. Yeah. Not unless Domenico proposes to you. Right. But her father basically forbids her from seeing him. Okay. But we all know what happens when a young girl is in love and somebody tells her she can't see the man she's fallen for. Yeah, same thing for a guy. <laughs> They're going to find a way, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. At first, Maria started taking a different route to the factory. And a couple of months go by. But one day in March of 1895, Maria found Domenico standing outside her factory again. And when she brushed past him, he said, of course, in Italian, mm -hmm. quote, I will marry you, end uh -huh. quote. Okay. Now, it all seemed very 16 candles to me. She comes out of the church and all the cars move away and waiting by the red Porsche is Jake. Right. I'm, can you tell I grew up in the 80s? Because that's what that made me think of. <laughs> we have it on our movie server here. We do. <laughs> but Domenico says, I want to get married. Except he's already married. And his wife and children are back in Italy. Is that a problem? I just think Domenico was horny and he wanted a girl. Yeah. That's what I think. Yep. Maria hurries home to tell her parents that Domenico wanted to be her husband. He wanted to make an honest woman out of her. This is just the best news ever. And a few days later on March 28th, Maria and Domenico stop at a bar on Christie Street where Domenico got Maria a soda. Hmm. She started sipping on it. And the room began to spin. Uh oh. He's roofied her in 1895. Rufalin? Roofies? Commonly known as the date rape drug? What kind of drug did they use? I don't know. Wow. But everything starts to spin. Hmm. And in a haze, Domenico leads Maria upstairs to a room above the bar. Hmm. Later that night, she wakes up in bed with Domenico sitting up beside her. Domenico congratulated her. For her virgin purity, oh, wow. which he had taken. taken. Wow. Maria was overwhelmed and she's ashamed. She told him, my reputation is ruined <laughs> and I can't go back to my parents. Yeah. And Domenico promised to find them a place. And she said, quote, marry me first, end quote. Okay. And according to many of the sources, Domenico just sort of winced at the idea like, <laughs> uh, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> marry you uh, I yeah. just 
I just wanted the sex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they move into a room on East 13th Street where each day started and ended with an argument hmm. because Domenico wouldn't marry her. Hmm. And she insisted they get married. Sure. They had to make it official. And all he ever did was put her off. He's also seeing other women at this time. Wow. On April 20th. Yeah, he's a cad. Yeah. He's a cad in 1895. Yeah. On April 20th, 1895, these two are having a fight. And Domenico tells her, I can't marry you. I already have a wife. And anyway, I'm returning to Italy to be with her. Oh, wow. And he tells Maria, quote, I'll find you a young man willing to marry you. I'll tell him you're a widow. I'll buy you a black dress. Gee, You'll marry him because I want you to. Then I'll come to visit while he's at work, end quote. What? Okay. What a deal. What? Oh, man. Domenico. Yeah, he's a pig. Yeah. And that word's going to get, that's called foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, foreshadowing pig. Mm -hmm. Okay. Six days later, on the morning of April 26th, 1895, New York was having a heat wave. Just the day before, the temperature in New York City jumped from 52 degrees to 90 degrees. It's wow. the end of April. Wow. Maria and Domenico were fighting when Philomena, her mother, comes to the door to plead with Domenico to marry Maria. Okay. But he pushes the mom aside he runs down the stairs to the street and walked to Mancuso's bar, which is just two doors down on East 13th Street. Hmm. And Maria and her mother follow him into the saloon 10 minutes later. Okay. Domenico is playing cards. It's 930 in the morning. <laughs> now, Filomeno, Maria's mom, mm -hmm. gave Domenico an earful. She was madder than a wampus cat in a rainstorm. I'm sure. And if you don't know what a wampus cat is, it's a half dog, half cat creature that can run on two legs instead of four. I did not know that. It's rumored to be seen just after dark or right before dawn all throughout the Appalachian Mountains. This episode is just full of all kinds of little trivia. Yeah, and I guess when it's wet, it's, it's mighty angry because it's a wet wampus cat. <laughs> okay. A wampus cat in the rain. And yet we digress. <laughs> Now, according to one source, Filomeno asked him, quote, how can you be so deaf to your own people's customs, end quote. Hmm. She told him in Italian, quote, marry her or she'll never be able to hold her head up again, end quote. Okay. And Domenico teased that he would marry Maria if her parents paid him $200. Oh. That's a fortune for Maria's family. Wow. And her mother said to him, we don't have that kind of money. Jeez. And as Filomena storms away, Maria stepped close to Domenico and asked him one last time if she was going to be his wife. Okay. Domenico said, quote, only a pig would marry you, end quote. Wow. Solo un miale ti sposerebbe. I'm sure I messed that up, but that is only a pig would marry you. Gee whiz. That's the foreshadowing. He's the pig. That's harsh. Maria put her hand on his shoulder and he tried to push her away. She said nothing, but pulled a straight razor from her sleeve, grabbed him by the hair of the head, tilted his head back and slit Domenico Cataldo's throat. Wow. He stood up staggered out the door, leaving a trail of blood behind him all down East 13th Street before falling dead at the corner of Avenue A. Well, I didn't see that coming. Blood was gushing from him. Wow. And he's staggering around. He's scaring people before he just falls dead. Gee whiz. Now, Maria casually goes home. <laughs> she changes out of her bloody clothes. My work is finished here. But it's not like she didn't have witnesses. <laughs> He's playing cards Jeez. in a bar. Wow. And it didn't take long for the police to find Maria. Right. When they arrested her, she said in broken English, quote, me take his blood so he no take mine. Say me pig Mary, end quote. <laughs> so Maria was arrested, charged with murder, and incarcerated at the New York prison, The Tombs. 
It was the New York City Halls of Justice and the House of Detention. And sitting at White and Center Streets in Lower Manhattan, it was an imposing Egyptian-style building that was erected in 1838 by John Haviland. Okay. And while most likely the name The Tombs is inspired by the building's resemblance to an Egyptian tomb, credit for the name remains in doubt. Although the original tomb, like the building, is long gone, the nickname is still used, so they still call it The Tombs. Okay. She was 27 at the time of the murder, or 25, depending on which source you use. She spent two and a half months in the tombs and was visited every day by a family member. And a little-known attorney, Amos Evans and Henry Sedgwick, it's Henry's first trial, are appointed to her case. <laughs> what, a, what a first trial. Case. I know. So sensational. She told them of her love of Domenico, how much she loved him and his refusal to marry her. And then she didn't see her attorneys again until she appeared in court on July 11th. Really? Yeah. Jeez. Didn't see him again. Wow. They talked to her once. Wow. I guess once is enough It's if it's your first trial. In 1895, I guess that's all you needed. Yeah. <laughs> on that day, she appeared wearing a dress she had made while in prison. She was resourceful. She was, and she wore a dark gray felt hat trimmed with orange flowers and feathers. Okay. She was escorted into the courtroom by Mrs. Foster, the tombs angel, this according to the July 19th, 1895 New York Times. So she must have been the, the jail matron. Okay. Maria was physically weak, and Mrs. Foster sat beside her with one arm around her, holding her hand. Now, this is a woman who doesn't even speak English very well and doesn't really understand it very well, okay? Right. Twelve men had been chosen as the jurors, and not a one of them were Italian. Mm. And the judge in the case was John W. Goff, and Maria's confession was read by John O'Rourke of the East Fifth Street Police. Okay. It reads, in part, quote, she admitted having entered the bar while Domenico Cataldo was playing cards. Then after having grasped the man by the hair and pulled his head back, she had cut his throat. Then she ran away. Domenico ran after her, but almost immediately he had fallen to the ground dead. The woman confessed that she had been relieved when she saw him fall because she was afraid of him. End quote. Well, yeah. I mean, she's after everything that he was... Putting her through yeah. and insulting her. and Drugged her. Yeah, drugged her. Took and, her virginity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In his deposition, police officer O'Reilly, got to be an O'Reilly, right? He's yeah. a police officer. <laughs> yeah, he opened an auto parts store later yeah. on in life. <laughs> he says, quote, I went immediately to Miss Barbella's apartment where, hidden behind a stool, I found a bloody cotton dress, end quote. Mm. The deputy coroner, John Huber, testified that Domenico had died from a loss of blood from a neck wound, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, caused by the six-inch long knife that Maria had used to stab him. Wow. Well, she slit his throat. I don't know that she stabbed him, but he says stabbed him. Gotcha. The defense used by Maria's attorneys was that Domenico made a practice of seducing women with false promises and that Maria was one of his victims. Mm. Domenico was portrayed as a, quote, a gambler, a libertine of the worst kind, end quote. <laughs> he was a player. <laughs> <laughs> the prosecution's case was that Maria premeditated the murder, that she had the razor up her sleeve expressly to cut Domenico's throat. Mm -hmm. But what worked against her the most was the fact that she didn't speak English well, and the court-appointed translator translated her emotional pleas and her words in a dull monotone. Hmm. And the jury was not swayed. In fact, they're bored to death. <laughs> I can just hear it. I was really scared of him and I feared for my life. And Yeah, I, I think that's what it was like. Yeah. He drugged me. Yeah. He took my virginity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just like snoozing. The 12 guys are over there in the jury box snoozing. Yeah. The prosecution stated that the defense tried to enlist sympathy, but from the character of the evidence, there was nothing for the jury to do but to find a verdict of murder in the first degree. Mm. Okay. 
They told the court that Maria's defense counsel had insanity experts examine her, and they all reported that she was not insane at the time of the trial or at the time of the killing. Okay. I take issue with that. I think she was temporarily insane. Well, it just sounds like she was driven to the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Maria gets little sympathy. On trial in that July, Judge John Goff guaranteed her conviction by telling the jury, wait till you hear this, oh, quote, no. we cannot publicly proclaim a woman not guilty of killing a man solely because this man has proposed marriage and then changed his mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leading the witness, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> and he's the judge. Yeah, I know. That's crazy. He also states that from the evidence, it appeared that Maria had acted in a fully conscious manner. He asked the jury not to have mercy on Maria. He said, quote, your verdict must be an example of justice. A jury must not concern itself with mercy, end quote. Uh, Why did they even have a jury? Why did they even have a trial? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, the jury didn't take long. In less than 45 minutes, the jury convicted her of murder in the first degree. Wow. New York's papers were all about it. (laughs) I'm sure they were. The verdict, the mocking. They would like mock Maria's broken English version of Domenico's final insult. Quote, say me pig Mary, end quote. That was in the newspaper. Wow. On July 18th, 1895, Maria was to be sentenced. And on that day, when her family arrived, a five-inch long blade was taken away, was confiscated from her aunt. Really? And two more pocket knives were taken from her sister. She was. Make of that what you will. Yeah. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. Yeah, that's that's a serious family. When Judge Goff got in his chair, he sentenced her to death. She was the first woman sentenced to die in New York City in 75 years. Really? Wow. Since the early 1800s. Wow. And the first to die by the electric chair. It was the newest thing in execution, and New York had one. Woohoo! So basically, they were um, they were doing hangings before that. They were that? hanging them before that. That's exactly right. In the public square. Yeah. Yeah. Quote: It is ordered that within 10 days from the present date the sheriff of New York or his agents transmit you into the custody of the warden of the state prison at Sing Sing. Ah, Sing Sing. (laughs) Yes. And from that time, you be kept in solitary confinement, allowed to see no one but the keepers of your person, your family, or a priest or minister of the gospel and your attorneys until the week beginning on August 19th, 1895, when the warden of the state prison is commanded to inflict upon you the death penalty by electricity, end quote. Wow. Maria was led away, and as she reached the door, her mother rushed out of the crowd to her. Her father and her brother followed. The deputies pushed them back, and she's she's led away. She's off hmm. to Sing Sing. She was. Judge Goff said, quote, oh, wait till you hear this. This is rich, man. (laughs) Bring it on, Judge. Quote, this is the United States and not Italy. And Italians who come here must learn that the stiletto, meaning a blade, and the razor as instruments of justice are under ban, end quote. Do you think there's a little bias going on here? Uh, dude, <laughs> we're this is America. We're all from somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Unless you're a Native American, Judge Goff, <laughs> which I don't think you are. Yeah. Maria was transferred to Sing Sing, and she's the only female prisoner and the first on death row. Wow. Do you know why it's called Sing Sing? No, I don't. The name Sing Sing was derived from the Sint Sink Native American tribe from whom the land was purchased in 1685. Really? Yeah. So Sing Sing is Sint Sink, hmm. but they changed it to Sing Sing. Okay. And it's still called Sing Sing. Yeah. Maria's case is talked about nationwide and in Italy, hmm. and many people maintain that she shouldn't die for this. She should live. And hundreds of letters were sent to New York's Governor Morton criticizing the state for this death sentence. Sure. 
She awaited her fate at Sing Sing and was scheduled to die the week of August 19th. But while she waited, Maria found an advocate. Countess Cora Slocum, an American who had married an Italian nobleman, was moved to tears when she sees a story about her conviction, and she's over in Italy. Okay. So the Countess de Brazza hurried to New York. Wow. To her aid, to Maria's aid. I guess if you're going to have somebody coming to your aid, a countess would be a good one. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. Girls stick together. Girl power. (laughs) (laughs) She hired Frederick House, a respected attorney, to mount an appeal, and she organized a clemency campaign that flooded Governor Levi Morton with letters. <laughs> but he couldn't make a decision until after her appeal. And women's rights activists, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, joined the cause. And if you don't know who she is, Elizabeth Cady Stanton formulated the agenda for women's rights that guided the struggle well into the 20th century. Really? Yes. Hmm. So all these women are coming to Maria's aid. And after 11 months in prison, Maria Barbella's appeal succeeds. Okay. On April 21st, 1896, the Court of Appeals ordered a new trial based on Judge Goff's impartiality and omitted testimony. (laughs) Yeah, you think? Yeah, I think. Just just a little bit. Robert De Niro. Just a little bit. A little bit. Insulted him a little bit. You got a little out of order yourself. Go ahead. In the appeal, the judge, Judge O'Brien, we got an Irish judge now, condemns Judge Goff when he referred to her in the, quote, following language. She lived with him at the time in meretricious intercourse. Hmm. It was a mode of life condemned by sound public morals, end quote. Uh, So she's being executed on the basis of morals. Yep. Yeah. She is. Harumph, yeah. harumph. That's what that sounded like to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm a man. Harumph, harumph. <laughs> I didn't get a harumph out of you. She knew what she was doing. <laughs> Play the saddles. Yeah. The assistant DA, John F. McIntyre, who prosecuted the case, said when he had time to examine the decision of the Court of Appeals, he would move in court that Maria would be allowed to plead guilty to manslaughter, which has a maximum punishment of 20 years in prison. Hmm. Uh, That's kind of like saying, okay, so we won't kill you. And we'll let you, we'll allow you to plead guilty. Yeah. And we'll put you in prison for 20 years. Right. I read in the New York Times that Judge Goff refused to give a statement to the press. (laughs) He he, he wanted nothing to do with it now. You know he's angry. Oh, yeah. He's stewing somewhere. Yeah. That same day, April 21st at 10.30 a.m., the warden at Sing Sing is told by telephone about the appeal. Warden Sage was, quote, greatly pleased with the result as it was the most disagreeable case he had ever had on his hands, and he was glad there was little chance that he would have to officiate an execution of a woman, end Hmm. quote. Okay. Maria was in her room in the upper part of the prison. He waited until Mrs. Sage, who was gone that day, came back that evening, quote, Mrs. Sage has taken great interest in her. When the girl reached the prison, she was greatly excited and thought she was about to suffer death at once. Mrs. Sage finally got her to understand that she wasn't being executed that day. So that's what she was thinking was happening. She was. But while Maria was at Sing Sing, Mrs. Sage taught her how to speak and read English. But when they told her she was granted another appeal, she was afraid. And didn't want to undergo another trial because she was afraid of the judge and the attorneys. Mm. She was afraid she was going to have to go back to Judge Goff. Yeah. Judge Asshole. Yeah. But she finally understood what was happening. Okay. While she was at Sing Sing, she was constantly watched by a matron. And they had to employ two women. And one of them sat outside her door each day and each night. Really? Yeah. they're, They're keeping her safe from all the men at Sing Sing. Sure. Maria was taken out of Sing Sing and transported back to the tombs while she was going to await her second trial. And at first she didn't want to go because she didn't want to leave Mrs. Sage. Mm -hmm. The second trial in December 1896 had a much different tone and it lasted 24 days. Oh, wow. The new judge allowed testimony sympathetic to Maria, including nine days of medical witnesses who documented a history of epilepsy in her family. 
They did have an eyewitness who said Domenico reached for a pistol before Maria slashed his throat. Mm. But they went with a seizure defense. Something that had only been successful four times in a court of law and never in the United States. A seizure? A seizure defense. Okay. Attorney House argued that Maria had killed Domenico while blinded by a seizure brought on by, quote, the CADS pig quip, end quote. (laughs) It's a stretch, but okay. He dismissed Domenico as a, quote, lascivious libertine, end quote whom, quote, the city will not miss, end quote. (laughs) Nobody's going to miss Domenico. A lascivious libertine. Yeah. He's a player. Why didn't they just say that? He's an (laughs) F-boy. Yeah. (laughs) In just 40 minutes, the jury voted to acquit. Oh, wow. And Maria Barbella, she was found not guilty and walked free. Really? Yes. Wow. Because what they did was they brought in all these experts who said, listen, epilepsy runs in her family. She's Mm. an epileptic. Yeah. And she just went into this fit. Wow. She soon married another Italian immigrant from her village, Francisco Paolo Bruno, on November 4th, 1897. It was a courtship of less than 24 hours. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Maria and Francisco were married by a judge at the headquarters of the Democratic Third Assembly, District 31 on Charlton Street. I got to get all that in. If it's in the paper, (laughs) I'm putting it in. All right. Emmanuel Friend, one of the attorneys, gave her away, and her brother Joseph was the best man. I hope she checked to make sure that he wasn't married and had kids. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Oh, no. Okay. After the ceremony, they were driven to 129 Forsyth Street. Francisco is a barber and worked at a barber shop at 227 Central Avenue in Brooklyn. That's ironic. (laughs) Isn't it, though? Yeah. He arrived in New York from Italy two months before the wedding. Quote, my mother knew Mr. Bruno's family in Italy. I never saw him until Tuesday. This is a Thursday paper, so two days. He was. Quote, I didn't want to marry him. I waited until 12 o'clock, and then my mother said, I must marry him. I wanted to wait a year, but my mother would not let me. Hmm. We went to his office yesterday, and he took us to the place where we were married, end quote. All right. In 1899, Maria and Francisco have a baby boy. They name him Frederick. Okay. But in 1902... Maria Barbello Bruno is living back with her parents. Her husband, Francisco, returned to Italy and remarried. Wow. After this, Maria slipped into obscurity and lived the rest of her days outside the headlines. Hmm. In April of 1899, three years after Maria's acquittal, Martha M. Place was the first woman to die in the electric chair, and she was executed at Sing Sing. Oh, wow. But that is the story of Maria Barbello. Don't diss a woman. (laughs) Don't call a woman a pig. Yeah. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, gentlemen, it just proves that don't use the word pig. Uh, yeah. Don't tell a woman you're going to marry her and then have yeah. a wife and kids <laughs> in another country. I mean. Yeah, just stupid. No, you never want to kill anybody, no. obviously. No. But, yeah, don't be an asshole. Yeah. And she was just coming up against man after man after man yeah. who were just horrible to her. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Wow. Well, We've come a long way, baby. Yes, we have. Or, yes, you have. <laughs> I haven't not, come a long way not, at all. Not far enough, but we've come a long way. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on to a little, well, bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. All right. So this week's bless your hearts, I'm going to start with this one. Assault with a deadly candy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I want to thank our in-laws and outlaws member, D. Hopkins, for this one. Oh, thank D? Yeah, she had posted a little uh, meme in there, and it was pretty funny. So oh, and the I, in-laws and outlaws. Yeah, so I looked it up, and here's here's how it goes. A Minnesota man was arrested after an apparent outburst inside a restaurant where he allegedly began throwing Skittles at people inside the establishment. Oh, 
don't taste the rainbow. <laughs> the incident happened at a restaurant in Mankato, Minnesota, and I apologize. Mankato. I, is it Mankato? Yeah, we right. have we know somebody from Mankato. Really? Yeah. Okay. Steve. Right. Steve's from Mankato. I did not know that. Mankato. Okay. Minnesota. Minnesota. Sorry, Minnesotans. I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> well, the incident happened at a restaurant in Mankato, Minnesota, on June 23rd when 19-year-old Tristan Statina. I think okay. that's how you pronounce his name, allegedly entered a local restaurant when he began yelling and throwing Skittles at employees and customers. According to a statement of probable cause, one of the victims told police officers that she was hit in the back with a Skittle, which caused a <laughs> stinging pain in her back area. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Those deadly Skittles. Give me a break. Give me a Kit Kat. That's a Kit Kat bar. Okay. Responding <laughs> officers saw Skittles all over the ground, as well as a bag of popular candy located near the garbage. When police located Statina and arrested him, the suspect allegedly wrapped his leg around one of the officers trying to trip him, the document states. He also attempted to pull away and break free as he was being placed under arrest. In total, it took three police officers to get control wow. of the suspect, according to probable cause statement. Statina is being charged with obstruction of legal process, interfere with police officers, Fifth degree assault, disorderly conduct, and fifth degree possession of schedule one, two, three, four drugs, not oh. a small amount of marijuana. Are we sure he was throwing <laughs> Skittles? <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, all that came just because he walked in a restaurant and started throwing Skittles. I'm, I'm thinking somebody probably turned around and was like, here, hit me in the mouth, right here. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you're catching grapes or dude, something. Dude, right here, man, right here. <laughs> I can catch it. Yeah. I can. Oh, uh, well. Okay, number two. Mommy said. Oh, I, I, I've said that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Mommy always said, don't rob a bank. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, don't rob a bank. Yeah, a Boston robber, Zachary Tantoni. We got a little Italian in there. Yeah. Yeah. Was caught after accidentally leaving a birth certificate and a note from his mom at the crime scene. Oh, <laughs> well, you know how us moms hang on to the birth certificates until oh, yeah. you're like 30 because we don't trust you with them. <laughs> exactly. He was charged for snatching a woman's wallet and booked for unarmed robbery. The alleged robbery victim said she was walking through the schoolyard in the field corner train station in Dorchester when the robber approached her from behind. Her bag contained her ID and $40 cash. In the process of grabbing her bag, the stupid criminal dropped two bags himself that he had clothes in and a pair of sneakers. On the top of one of the bags was a letter that Tontini's Mother had written him and his birth certificate. Police were able to find the man matching the description within hours. He was found just a block away. Please excuse him. Yeah. From... Upon, upon finding him, he lied to the police. Well. That his name is John Foise and kept confirming the certificate wasn't his. It is not mine. Yeah. He was fined $10,000 in cash and bail was set at $500. And I bet his birth certificate went back to his mother. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number three. Shut up. Okay. A police officer pulled over a driver and informed him that because he was wearing his seatbelt, he had just won $5,000 in a safety competition. What are you going to do with the prize money? The officer asked. Is that real? The man responded, I guess I'll go to driving school and get my license. <gasps> At that moment, his wife, who was seated next to him, <laughs> chimed in, Officer, don't listen to him. He says he's a smart aleck when he's drunk. This oh woke my up, gosh. <laughs> this woke up the guy in the back seat who, when he saw the cop, blurted out, I knew we wouldn't get far in this stolen car. <laughs> Not true. At that moment, there was a knock on the trunk and a voice asked, are we no. over the border yet? Yeah, no, this is not true. I I saw this as a one of the criminal jokes and I thought, I got to put this in. So in all transparency, this is not a true story, but it's oh, hilarious. Oh, gosh. You had me going for a little bit because I was like, pull me over. Give me $5,000. Okay. And here's the last one. And I'm calling this Obedient Criminal. Obedient Criminal. Yeah, this is a really short one. Okay. Nathan Way Pugh, 49. He's 49 years old. A bank robber who abided by a Dallas teller's request for him to provide <laughs> two forms of identification before she could give him the money. 
He's been sentenced to more than eight years in prison. I've got this bag full of money, but I'm going to need two forms of ID first. Uh, hey, I don't know. I've got my birth certificate that my mom gave me. Uh, Hang on, I'll God. use that. It's just There's just a never-ending supply of stupid criminals. Well, if you have a bless your heart yeah. or you still have your mom hang on to your, <laughs> your, birth, your certificate. birth certificate. or and your write mom. you little notes yeah. as you go bankrupt. Yeah, or if she's written you a note or something to take with you in the last 30 days. Yeah. Or if you know somebody whose heart needs blessing is yes. what I was trying to get to, <laughs> go to hitchtohomicide.com. There's a pull-down menu where you yep. can also suggest a case. Yep. I don't know if I said this at the beginning of the podcast or not, though. What? Be sure to go join the in-laws and outlaws. Yeah. yeah. That's our closed Facebook group. We have lots of fun in there. We love everybody in there. And if I've said it twice, well then, so be it. And also, I have to say, make sure you answer the three questions. We have a lot of people that haven't answered any questions, and we can't add you if you don't answer We need to make sure you're ready for everything that we do, and you yes. want to be there. So we've got a little backlog of people who need to answer the questions. Yes. That's all we have today. Yep. That's my amazing husband out there. And that's my beautiful bride in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Bye, y'all. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, Bella. Ciao, Bella.